Hello, my friends, and welcome to this wonderful Twitch stream where I'm going to talk all about ML Ops using GitHub Actions. I apologize in advance for my janky slate. This is my first time using Twitch, and I am not much of an artist, but I am a definitely a machine learning person. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about ML Ops using GitHub Actions, all of this goodness up here that you see. We're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, make sure if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I have the chat window open right right here. And so if you have any questions about what's going on, I am happy to answer those questions as we go along. This is all for you. So please let me know. And if if you want me to digress a little bit, I'm I can I can totally do that too. Like say you want me to just say, wait, I, I really want to know more about this other bit, just let me know and we will do that. My my colleague and friend, uh, David Smith is here also to answer questions on the chat, but I'll be monitoring, monitoring it here so that I can um, answer any questions you might have. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about machine learning in general. Uh, so this is our agenda piece. We'll talk about machine learning in general. And again, I'm not a fancy Twitch streamer. I don't, I don't, I, I figured out this picture in picture thing, which I think is glorious, uh, but I will get better at it, I promise. So I'm gonna be pointing at my slides because I, I can do that, which is really fun. All this goodness up here is what we're gonna talk about. Machine learning, first of all, I'll do a brief overview of what machine learning is and how I think about it. We'll talk about, because you might've heard of the term ML ops, you might've heard of the term DevOps, there's something called AI ops. Um, if you have any questions uh, about those, let me know. But I am going to try to demystify this a little bit. Hello, Red Red Rose and Alex Ainga. Hopefully I said that correctly. Again, I'm going to watch the chat. So if there's any questions, please let me know. Then we're going to get into DevOps practice. We'll talk about GitHub Actions for the CI continuous integration bit. And then we'll talk about GitHub actions for the CD uh, part continuous delivery of machine learning models. And so welcome everybody, I'm so excited you're here. Again, if you have any questions, just put them in the box and I will answer them as I go because this is the first time I'm talking about this stuff that I built. It's pretty fun stuff. I actually really like it. So let's start off with machine learning in general. Over the years, it's gotten a little bit of a bad rap because of the awful things that have happened with AI and machine learning. Now, this is my stock joke that I've had for machine learning for many years, and I still think it's funny. I don't care what anybody says. Um, people give AI and machine learning a bad rap because they don't understand what it's actually doing. And it's not as complicated as one would think. Um, there are some complications, but once you understand what it's actually doing, my sense is that it's not as bad as people make it out to be. And then once you know what it is, then you start to get a sense for, well, if I'm a software engineer, how do I put this all into perspective and make it work the right way? So let's talk about, let's talk about what it is anyways. What is machine learning anyways? or AI anyway. So imagine artificial intelligence as this big bubble. And I, I shouldn't say bubble because that's bad in tech speak. So imagine artificial intelligence is this, that way, this big bubble. So what is artificial intelligence? To me, it's anything that makes a computer seem intelligent. It's just like, for example, it can think, it can play, it can do stuff. A good example would be many years ago, you might have heard as uh, Kasparov uh, playing Deep Blue. Yes, I'm going to try. I'm going to make these. I'm, I'm recording right here. And so they're probably going to be putting up the question from Maddie is the recording. Will it be available afterwards? The answer is yes. Uh, I will make sure of it. So imagine this big bubble is artificial intelligence. What fits in there? Well, your chess player. You ever played chess against the computer? I'm not very good at it. But imagine playing chess against a computer. That's AI. But nowadays, people don't call that AI. They're like, oh, no, that's that's old school stuff. Or, for example, imagine writing a program that can do tic-tac-toe. Like you can. I wrote, a, I wrote a program that I played tic-tac-toe against that I could never beat. The best I could do is draw. And the reason why is because 
artificial intelligence in the early 90s or before uh, was basically a bunch of rules and then searching. For example, uh, if you're if you're on Waze and it tells you to go a different way, that's artificial intelligence. But to you, it isn't because as a programmer, you're thinking, well, that's just doing pathfinding. And when there's a lot of traffic, all of a sudden that that edge on the graph has a lot of weight, and so it's going to switch me to another. And so AI early on was basically a way of doing glorified search, right? And so A star, for example, is an algorithm that you may have heard of. That's an AI algorithm. Minimax is an algorithm. But the thing about these types of algorithms, I got to point this way, um, is that the search space was finite. Even though it might have been large, it was still finite. For example, chess uh, or tic-tac-toe, if you want to think of Minimax algorithm, basically if the tic-tac-toe is drawn right there. I'm drawing it with my hand because I'm a goober. If you put an O in the top left-hand corner, right, the computer could say, well, if I put all X, an X here, then he could put or she could put an O here. And then you could build this tree decisions that happen where it's if they do this, I can do all these things. And for each one of those, they can do all those things. And then basically you search, right? But the search base is finite. Even for chess... It's still finite, but there are a certain class of algorithms where the search space is not finite. Like for example, is there a cat in this picture? Well, that search base is much larger. And so it's harder to quantify. How do I even search that? And there are a class of algorithms inside of artificial intelligence called machine learning that help you solve those kinds of unbounded problems. That are hard to they're hard to to search. And so A star, Minimax, etc., those were search algorithms, and you created decision trees and you went and searched them, right? But machine learning is different because the search space is infinite. Like in the space of all pictures, which ones are cats, there are literally an infinite amount of pictures that you can do. Eh, well, I don't know about literally, but figuratively, almost literally, there's an infinite amount of pictures that you can actually generate. And again, if for those that are joining, you can ask questions in the chat. I've got it up here so that I can answer as I go. So hello everybody and welcome Lux, my friend. So these classes of algorithms are different because it's not doing a search over a space. Basically what you're doing is you're giving the computer a set of examples of the right thing. Like here are a picture of a bunch of cats. And what it does is it produces an algorithm for you. And that sounds a little magical, but it isn't. Uh, basically, machine learning, you pick shapes of functions. Because to me, machine learning is a way of making a function. But instead of compiling it, you're giving data. And then it figures out the best state inside of its representations to produce the right output. And so that's machine learning. Now, hello, Opus 1993. Welcome to this. I'm glad you're here. Inside of machine learning, there are a class of algorithms called deep learning algorithms that basically use neural networks as the foundation of the function shape that it learns. So machine learning to me is just a different way of writing a function that instead of it being programmed is learned. And when I say learned, it basically just means optimized. And so that's that's what it's all about. Uh, and again, I'm gonna we're gonna try to make this recording available after. If you can't stay, that's totally okay. So deep learning again. There's an open question about how deep the neural networks have to be in order for it to be be deep learning. I guess it depends on the marketing guy. So when should I use it? When when is this a good hammer? Because when when you when you're building algorithms, you're basically you know like if you if you've gone to computer science school and if you haven't, that's totally okay. They're like here's some hammers that you can use for certain classes of problems. Like here's a dynamic programming problem, and this is when you should use this. Or here is a search problem, and here and when you're doing a search here, you use BFF. Like there's certain strategies, and so the question is when should I use machine learning? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a dumb example with a check. And this is a really dumb example and I'm gonna go through it really fast because I wanna get to the meat of what we're talking about. And so imagine you work at a bank. If any of you work at a bank, thank you. Uh, that should be in the dirty jobs show for computer scientists. 
Not because it's a bad thing to do, but because I can only imagine what your databases look like. And I don't want to imagine too much. So imagine you work for a bank and you're a star programmer. Let's just say your name is Sue. Sue, you're the star programmer at the bank. And one day the marketing guy comes down and says, I have an awesome idea. Let me tell you about it. And the idea they had was they wanted you to build an algorithm such that if they give you a picture of a check, and that's I have depicted the check right over here. If they give you a picture of a check, you need to write in an algorithm that could figure out if it's upside down or not. So that way they could process it. That's all, that's all you had to do. And um, as a programmer, you're like, okay, I mean, I, I guess I could figure that out. And it turns out that in your particular role, you work at a really crappy bank and all of the checks have a black stripe at the top of it, black stripe. So as a programmer, you could, you could figure this out. Like we're gonna use our programmer lizard brains. And if you're not a programmer, that's okay. We have lizard brains that literally look at every problem and try to figure out what the steps are. Like if I do this first, then I do this, but then this might happen here and then I have to do this, right? And so that's how our programmer lizard brains work. So if you had a picture of a check with a black stripe at the top of it, how would you know if it's upside down or not? Well, our programmer lizard brains come up can come up with a couple of scenarios. For me, I'd just be like, well, let me just pick a random 100 pixels at the top of the picture. And if they're all black, right side up. If they're not, flip it around. And so you tell the marketing guy, oh, uh, yeah, this is, I can do it. It's going to take six hours. It's going to take three, but there's a lot of YouTube to watch. There's a lot of awesome Twitch content, too. If I may say so myself, I was watching the other day. It was great. Um, so it's going to take like an hour, but really you say six because we always, we always, you know, double buffer just in case. Six hours goes by and you are done and it's awesome. You get it to work. So then they come back down and they're like, look, the owner of the bank, she loves her horses. And so just this one thing, can you put the picture of the horses on just her check? Just this one thing. The programmers get told it's just this one thing all the time and it it gives us a little bit of uh, the feels if you know what I mean so uh, you say okay uh, this pro this problem is a little bit harder if you're a programmer but it's not that much harder basically you say give me a picture of a of a horse and we can do some some code where we look at pixels because we know sort of right the code is ugly and you will have to go home and take an extra long shower because you wrote that code. Uh, but nonetheless, you can do it. Now, the third time they come back down to you and they say, hey, um, so you did such a good job. I think I think the programmer's name is Sue again, if I remember right. That we want you to do it for any picture, for any person, for any check. And as a programmer, you feel, hopefully you felt that chasm between a black stripe, a single picture, and all the pictures. It is in that chasm that machine learning does its best work. Because basically what programming is, is programming is we come up with a function or a series of steps, we give it input and the output comes out. Machine learning is the opposite. It flips that around so that we give the answers and the input and out comes a function or an algorithm. So if you ever heard, hear the term machine learning model, to me, because I started as a, pro, I was a programmer for 10 years and then I went to grad school and did machine learning, a mo machine learning model is an alternative way of saying a function that was written in a different way. In comes the data, out comes the model. The question is what happens in here? But basically, a machine learning model is a function that is written in a different way. Okay, that's, that's all you gotta think about. So if you ever heard machine learning model and you're a programmer, just think function written in a different way. And it may or may not work all the way. And the crazy thing is if you're a data scientist, if it works 100% the right way the first time, we get scared and we're like, something is very wrong and we work very hard to figure out why it's right. So today we're gonna go through a very important machine learning example. Um, I think it has implications to society at large. I think it's gonna help many people, you know, figure out how to get world peace, etc. But we're going to create a machine learning model that learns to detect between a taco, a burrito, and a taco. 
And to me, this is a very important problem. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, I'm going to show you where the code is. I'm not going to explain how it works, but if you want, I can. Uh, but I'm just basically going to tell you that it does work. And I'm going to show you that it actually does. And so let's go through and do a bit of a local example here, if I may. So here is some glorious handcrafted code that I wrote using TensorFlow. If you look over here, there is some data here. Let me go to, uh, let me do this reveal file and explorer goodness. There it is. And inside you're going to see indeed some burritos. This one snuck in there. Oh yes, Maddie, not MNIST, not this time. There is more important problems to solve like tacos and burritos. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. So again, here's some pictures of some burritos that I acquired. I bingled with Bing, and uh, I don't know how that one got in there, but it did. And here is some wonderful tacos, beautiful tacos. It's getting near my dinner time, so apologies. And what happens is in TensorFlow, I mean, I'm going to do like a three-step process. The first is I'm going to prepare the data. And basically what this is going to do is this is here. I'll just run it so everyone can see it. So uh, last pipeline dot command, you're going to see that there. It's basically going to run the preparation step, the training step, and the register step. Now, I've never ran this while I'm streaming. So let's see if my GPU can handle this goodness. So basically what's going to happen is you see it deleted these folders. And what it's going to do is it's going to take all of those pictures in the folder and squeeze them down and make it so that um, the pictures are all ready for TensorFlow to do its goodness. So basically I'm looking at all the pictures, making sure they're the right size, that they don't have more than three channels because everything will blow up. Here you can still watch it. Look, it's doing its thing. It's squeezing all the taco burrito pictures. When that's done, I'm going to use some TensorFlow goodness to load these TF records is what I'm doing. And I'm using transfer learning, aka stealing learning, where I'm using MobileNet V2, which is a basically the, fun remember I told you about functions? It bas I'm basically taking a function that's really good at doing pictures, and then I'm adding a layer over the top of it. It's like a cake. And I'm putting a special, you know, on a wedding cake, you just got to get the special thing to put at the top. That's what we're doing here. And it's going to learn between the two things, right? And then we're going to go ahead and train that. And then the last step we're going to do is we're basically going to pick the best model. So you can see right here, like there are all the TF records that, it, that it's been, that it found. And now it's actually doing the training. Oh no. See it broke. I think it's because there was a problem with my GPU. So I'll run it one more time. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. But basically, um, the training step is the second step that it does, where basically it just takes this function shape, pushes all the pictures through it, and it updates its internal state in such a way that it's trying to find the best way to actually predict whether things are uh, tacos or real. Yes, it is indeed, Maddie, if you're wondering, um, it is indeed TensorFlow. So let's see if it works now, uh, because it didn't. Last time I did this, I had to like, I had to look at it the whole time. So l l notice that I have a, a wonderful GPU on, this is a laptop, by the way. I have a GeForce RTX 2080. Here we go. We're going to run this for all of you all right now. Hopefully it, it's able to execute it. Again, I'm using my GPU. See, yeah, it looks like looks like there's a problem with the GPU. I think OBS is hogging it. And so none of that is going to work because it stinks, which brings up a very good question. What if the stuff can't run locally? That's okay. We have a cloud we're going to use in a second. But basically, this code works, but not while I'm running OBS. And you can see that what it does is it takes MobileNet v2, puts a layer on top of it, and builds it out. It's actually pretty simple. And I'll, I'll show you it actually running. Yes, Hay Haywire's like, why? Yes, it's because I'm, I'm using all of my good hardware to actually talk to you. So there, this is for you. All right, 
so uh, basically, this uh, uh, trains the model. Looks like it wasn't able to make any models, unfortunately. That's okay. I'm going to show you some other models. Um, and again, when I say models, just think lazy way of writing a function with data. Okay, so that's the local thing. If you want to know where this all actually lives, great question. So you can run it yourself. Um, it's all here. Uh, and you can totally download. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a zoom it. Kapow, look at that. Look at that goodness. Should I make it bigger? Can you all see this? There it is, github.com, cloud scale ML, seer. By the way, Cassie is here too, who helped me write some of this stuff, bless her heart. Oh, thank you for that uh, non-famous deed, AKA David Smith. Okay, uh, so if you'd like to know more about this code and how it works, I'm happy to tell you that, but I wanna get to the GitHub action stuff because I promised it. Notice that it's an abject failure locally. So I'm gonna use a computer in the cloud that is not using a GPU to stream all of my bad jokes. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this uh, good thing. Let's see if my, there you go. The machine learning process for me is uh, in general when we're doing this, we prepare some data. Notice I did that. We build and train and we evaluate. I had those three steps. And this here part where, by the way, it works it works already the way I set it up. But in general, we spend a long time in what I like to call the loop of sadness, which is where it never works until it does. Uh, so if you ever find your data, say, uh, data scientist under a table, they are currently in the loop of sadness, which is this... I'm oh, sorry, this loop right here where nothing is working. And then we get it to work and we're like, we're such geniuses. We made this model here, do stuff with it. And I kid you not, data science nowadays, sometimes we deploy via the 1993 method, well-known method of putting the model, which is just a file. And I'll show you, I can download it, which is just a file we put it on a zip drive and we give it to someone else. Or if we're more sophisticated, we put it on the share. I will send you the data set, Maddie. So make sure you hold me to that. Uh, the data set, I think I put it somewhere for uh, Cassie. If you go to the AIML 50 repo, I think the data set is in there. If you'd like to re uh, repo this goodness. And if you can't, then we should do another one where I figure out how to get my GPU to do more than one thing. Bad computer. Loop of sadness. Okay, so again, uh, machine learning is in the state of the art where we're literally, we're, we're literally, if you're a small shop, there's obviously people that are more sophisticated than this, but generally people put these miles, models in a file and they, they email them and say, here's the best one. It's not the right way to do things. The best way to do DevOps, if you're a data, if you're not a data scientist but a computer person, is you plan, you develop, you test, you release, you monitor and learn. And there's some really good practices behind DevOps, as my good colleague Donovan Brown says. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Some people try to zip disk, yeah, old school zip disk. Some people um, think DevOps is a product. It's not. It's people, process, products, the three Ps. Uh, and so the idea is that we should probably use some of these concepts in this machine learning process. We should, and, and we will. Now, you might have heard the term AI ops and ML ops. They are not the same thing. And I thought they were, and then I went and looked it up. I'm not going to read this to you because you all can read. But to me, AI ops is using machine learning to do DevOps. ML ops is using DevOps to do machine learning. Kapow. Man, we should record this. I'm so glad I'm recording. I just invented that phrase. I'm going to do it again. AI ops is using machine learning to do DevOps. For example, you might have a machine learning model that tries to detect if an algorithm is bad that someone wrote, or if it's using an open source license that it shouldn't be, right? You could write a predictor to do that, and that's part of the DevOps process, but you're using AI in the DevOps process. That's AI ops. Machine, uh, ML ops is doing DevOps for machine learning. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. 
Um, no, we're definitely not done, Carlton, with tacos and burritos. I just made it not work locally just to show you that I can make it work in the cloud. That was totally on accident. Like, I'm going to try to make it look like it's part of the show, but only Carlton and I will know. So don't tell anybody else. By the way, you might have heard of this thing called data ops. You know, I think all of us together that are watching, we should like just find a noun and put ops in at the end of it and do a startup together. I don't know, like I don't camel ops, where we get camels to ride. I don't know what's going with that. I should have, I should have tested this material. Taco ops, indeed. Yeah, see, this is what this is. Uh, data ops is automating doing anal an anal. I was gonna say analytics, and then wanted to say analysis, and they ran into each other. So that's. Like, it's really awkward for me right now. Hopefully, it's not awkward for you. But basically, data ops is automating analytics. Let's just say you have data here, 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 and you want to do a Power BI dashboard. Data ops is automating all of that so you have a beautiful thing. Oh, look at that. Roundlay is saying spec ops. Someone right now go by specops.ai, and I will literally be your janitor in your new startup because that sounds... Amazing. We'll get them next time. <laughs> Love it. We're going to focus on ML ops, not AI ops, uh, because we're going to show you how to do DevOps for machine learning. So some good DevOps practice, use source control, continuous integration and continuous delivery are the order of the day. Uh, now, data science de uh, source control is is weird, right? And let me let me show you why. Okay. And uh, I think Maddie like pointed out one of the reasons why. Like she couldn't just clone this and be like, I'm going to run it because we're missing something pretty important and that's the data, right? But then again, if I have 20 terabytes of taco and burrito pictures, which I may or may not have on a spare hard drive that's sitting somewhere in my house, how do you, how do you put that into source control? You don't. And then there's this other issue of like notebooks. Have you ever, if you've ever done Py, uh, IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, they're wonderful. They let you do a, a ton of different things. But then if someone else runs them and they got this and they check it in, all of a sudden you have a problem. So here are some tips that I've found that I am definitely not following here because I haven't changed. The last time I changed this one is November 8th. Um, and I've learned a bunch since then. I'm a bigger person now, I think. Uh, one of the things is when you check in I, uh, a Jupyter Notebooks, maybe check them in without the output. I think that's a good standard practice. You should do that. Uh, and you can see that, that, that I didn't do that here because I've become a bigger person since then because I, I have indeed put on the COVID-19, which is the same as the freshman 20. So by bigger, I mean weight. I think I'm sharing too much, but that's okay. The second thing that maybe you should do that I'm not doing here is maybe a way to get the data or at least a piece of the data that enables other people to do it. So maybe like 10 tacos and 10 burritos. I did not do that. Um, but definitely it's something you can do. So notice that I check things in all the time. So let's make a change here. Uh, I'm going to make an important change here. And obviously, we need to check that in. Get status. Oh, there's a change. Get add dot. Uh, get commit minus m. Ch, 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 changes. Not changes changes. By the way, I got a really loud clicky keyboard, so hopefully you're all enjoying the sound of that. And I always sign all my commits because I want people to know the code that I wrote. Uh, there it is. It's going up there. Glorious. So, um, I used, uh, there you go. So I used uh, source control for that goodness. So the question now is, how do I make this build a model for me automatically? And this is where GitHub Actions come in. And I could have made a nice slide of GitHub Actions, but 
To be honest, I didn't want to because I figured I would just show you. So in here, in this special folder called .github workflows, I have this thing called build. And it's super simple. Like, let me zoom, it, zoom in so everyone can see like how simple this is. The first thing is I, I have some secrets in order to make this run in the cloud. The second thing I do is I check it out. I install Python v6. I make sure the Azure ML SDK is. Now, it, for you, you, maybe if you're using some other tool, it, it, this should all be the same. But basically, we're trying to run this in the cloud on a computer that's not, not mine that will definitely work. That's what we're trying to do. So you might have some steps here that you might need to do for your other, let's just say you have a wonderful machine somewhere in like the back of your house, right? And you wanna somehow push deployment to that, fine. And then, th then I run this thing, right? Which is uh, the pipeline.py file, which I didn't show you. And this pipeline.py basically says, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run a machine learning pipeline. And you, you say, well, what the heck is that? Well, it's basically doing these three steps, but in the cloud. How, pray tell, does one do such a thing? Lovely question. We use something called, we have something called Azure Machine Learning Studio, little s. I have to make sure to say little s because they put it there on purpose. Machine learning, our Azure Machine Learning Studio is infrastructure in the cloud to run these machine learning experiments. And that infrastructure includes a couple of things. Like for example, where what computers to run it on and what data to run it on, what data we use to generate these models. That's what those two things are. These things right here are other things that are on top of the infrastructure. Like for example, data sets. And you're like, well, what the heck is a data set versus a data store? Think of this as a place to put things and think of this as a view into the data store. So for example, you might dump a bunch of files, but you, want to, might, you might only want to machine learn based on a certain subset of that data. So you have a data set to do that. I'm only using data stores because I just want to run it on all my tacos and burritos. Experiments for us are, it's actually running, running that thing that I ran that failed. Um, a pipeline for us is a series of steps. An Azure Machine Learning Pipeline is a series of steps that we run in order to get a machine learning model to be built. So that's what machine learning pipeline is for me, right? Anything, any step. So if remember we had a prep step that made TF records, we had a training step that built the actual model, and then we had a register step that picked the best model. Now here we have these things called models. Now, as anything, whenever you build code, you're gonna wanna have versions of these things. These, some of these versions you may or may not use because they suck. Um, well, same here. We basically want to have versions and then we have endpoints of things. For example, we have endpoints that let you rerun pipelines to build models. Why? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. And I don't want to redline everything. Maybe we should use green a little bit because I'm using too many. We also have endpoints to do the actual prediction or run the prediction. By the way, if you are if you are here, just literally just ask questions. The question from Maddie is, does model also version hyperparameters? Yes, but that happens in the experiment, right? And so the cool thing is a model is the actual file. So if, if you're wondering, a model is basically a file. The, mo the models I'm building are HDF5 files because they're built in Keras, but the hyperparameters are stipulated during the experiment run. And you're saying, well, Seth, you should probably run an experiment run. Well. The fun thing is, my friends, I actually already am literally right. Give a second. Internet. I'm using a lot of it. It's actually running right now. And you're wondering, well, why is that? Well, because when I checked in my code, the GitHub action that we saw right here, uh, the build one, said run this pipeline code inside of Azure Machine Learning. And you can see right here, it's doing the data preparation step and it's doing the data model step. So let's go. So there's the data preparation. Remember how we saw this running, right? You can see all that going there. 
And then it's also going to do, let me go back to, let me close this here. It's going to do the model training step as well. And you can see that all of the parameters, the hyperparameters that I ran are basically here as well as Maddie so eloquently asked. Because the, the actual hyperparameters are parameters that we give the experiment to say, when you run this model, use these numbers. Like for example, the learning rate is something of a number that tells us how fast do we want to get to the answer without going over. And so it's, you have to like, it's more of an art than a science to pick these kinds of things. And then I said, pick an epoch of 15 with a batch of 10. These are the hyperparameters. Notice that we have burned in here. If you know anything about ML flow, these things are also burned in. So the question is, that uh, Maddie also has is, can you please show us the setup for hyperparameters? Yes, I did the lazy thing. See, he, he or she is calling me out. Um, basically, what I did is I let me go to the training. I basically passed it in, right? You can see it's passed in, and if I go to the pipeline.py file, when I'm uh, uh, when I'm creating the actual training step, I'm passing it in. Right, and so uh, uh, there it is. So I'm saying run 15, 10. Now we have we have some things. Uh, we have some some awesome things in Azure Machine Learning Studio, little less that lets you run hyperparameter search. It's called it. I think it's called hyperparameter search, where you can do grid search. You can do a bunch of other ones for these hyperparameters. Absolutely, you can run it, and you can make it work over the weekend because computers don't complain when they work. Well, I guess mine is because you can hear the GPU. Um, uh, so a good question uh, for Maddie, is that is that feature free? Yes, but the, the thing about it is, is you only pay per compute hour for the machines that you stand up. So let me go over here and notice that I have some compute environments. And now everyone's going to laugh at me because I named these things. Like this is my mom's name, obviously, family members. Uh, here's my compute cluster. It's my dad. And then here is my inference cluster. My grandma, of course. But, Maddie, uh, you can run these locally. And I have a blog post here. Uh, I'm, all, I'm all caps. Where you can run these things locally in your environment using Docker and push all of the experiment stuff up that you're seeing here into this workspace. So for example, this food AI one, the last run that you see, all of the metrics and, and all of this stuff, this was actually run on my machine, but the metrics were pushed up to Azure Machine Learning. And you can totally go, you can go to, go to sethwaras.com, tips for cloud ML, that talk about training these things locally, but pushing up all of the stuff up to the cloud. Thank you for keeping me honest. By the way, isn't this cool that you can see all of this wonderful goodness? By the way, this is another food AI one that I did that does tacos and burritos, but it does it with PyTorch. So I have two different examples. Let's go back to my other experiment where I'm showing pipelines. And it's almost done. Uh, I'm not trying to fill time here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hyperparam search on a laptop is like I'm literally sweating in here. Right, sweating in here. It's uh, terrible. Oh, thanks for that, uh, David, for putting that up. So there's the graph. Uh, looks like it, it's done. Uh, let me close this. Let me go to the model training. You're gonna be you're gonna be able to see all the parameters. Uh, the output log, for example. Here's the output log. You can see what you couldn't see on my own machine, which is it actually running which is nice, and it ran it for 15 epochs. And it looks like it got smarter. Uh, accuracy, 92 on training, 59% on the validation. Not so bueno, but again, I can retune, change my code, check in, and it's just going to run it, which is glorious. Okay, so notice that I've shown you CI, continuous integration. I checked in some code. GitHub Actions, and again, just a reminder, because I want I want, I want want everything to be super transparent. GitHub Actions here had this build pipeline that ran, and you're probably wondering, I never showed that to you, so let me go to that over here. 
uh, let me go to actions here and you can see that there was some changes that happened. I had a failure there and I'll show you that. We'll see what happened there. So basically this GitHub action you can see ran nine minutes ago and it ran this Azure machine learning pipeline. Okay, very nice. Uh, something is wrong with my other thing and we'll figure it out, but I actually have a deploy that should, that should work. Okay, so this is for continuous integration. All right, so basically CI is for anything having to do with building the actual model. Okay. So I did the GitHub Actions demo. It's basically a YAML file. And uh, if I go back to it, because I want to make sure that I tell you, notice that it says only run it when there's a push on the master branch. Only run it when a Python file changes. So for example, it might be that I changed the readme. I don't want my machine learning process to be kicked off. You can also even specify exact files to run this on. And so because a Python file changed or a requirements file changed, but not this one, because this one doesn't do anything for me for the machine learning process. But basically GitHub Actions allows you to stipulate whenever I push to the master branch, run this, which is run this pipeline code, right? You can also specify you can also specify this via something called the Azure Machine Learning CLI, but I wanted to show you how to do it via code. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so we did that demo. I also did an introduction on this whole Azure Machine Learning Studio, which allowed us to build that glorious pipeline that you saw right over here. Notice that this is a pipeline that ran in Azure Machine Learning Studio. And then the output was of that was it generated a model called SEER, and it was model number 37. Uh, that's the experiment. Sorry, I, I clicked on the wrong thing. So uh, there's the SEER model 37. Here's the actual artifacts, and it's this HDF5 file. And if I, let me just download it so you can see that basically. Like it's really cool because now all this stuff is saved. So let me go to the show and folder here. There's my downloads. And then when I go to model HDF5, oh no, let me see. Did I uninstall Netron? How embarrassing. So let me let me put this on my desktop here. Uh, so let me load this up again. So let me see if I have Netron installed. Netron, oh no, I must have installed it. Well, Netron is a wonderful uh, a file, uh, a program that lets you look inside of Model HDF5. It's basically a network. So I'm just gonna install it because this is Twitch and, it, and we all do stuff together. So let's see, Netron here. Uh, Netron, here it is. I thought I really had it installed. So let me download for Windows here. Uh, oh, did, they, did it disappear? Net, let's go to GitHub here. GitHub organization, and let's go to the, uh, not Electron, we want to go to Netron, here it is, I pushed on the wrong thing. So there it is, let's go to the uh, project itself here, oh, where, there's got to be some releases here, where, there's the releases, and looks like there it is, I, I just can't believe I did not have it installed, what the hee-haw? Uh, oh, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, version online. Look at that. I'm not going to delete this. I'm going to keep it. No, I want to keep it. Keep. Show more. Keep anyway. Yes. And, uh, they're saying I don't have to install anything. So if I go to, uh, Lutz, ro there we go. Uh, Lutz Rotor dot github.io from slash netron. So I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna say boom dot github.io. Very nice. And then I can go to here, uh, netron. They're saying I can run this on the, I, had, I did not know this. I don't see it. Looks like it was taken down. Crazy, wow. But anyways, uh, basically what that is supposed to be is it's supposed to let you see 
what is inside of the actual um, um, the actual. Sorry, I'm looking here to the side. It's supposed to show you what's what's inside the actual neural network. Uh, so that's a, that's a cool thing. Uh, looks like I can't download it, and so fail number two. I'm only allowed three fails. If the third fail happens, everyone is allowed to swear at me really loudly. Uh, but basically, if you look inside, this is what the model looks like, which everyone can tell is, is glorious. Okay, back to this. Uh, let's go to my slide. Let me go to resume slideshow here. Good. Now let's talk about what we did. We basically did data, data preparation, training, and model registration. But what about this bit? What about this bit? Um, we want to deploy this somehow. So this is the continuous delivery bit. How do we deliver value with the model? How do we ensure it's the right thing? How do we ensure it works properly? In Azure Machine Learning, we have this file. We have uh, services that you can put out with this score file. So basically, in Azure Machine Learning, you need to just make two functions. One is initialize the model in it, and then the other is score the model which is this right here. So let me go up here to this code right here. All right, basically it loads the SEER model, which is the model HDF5 and the metadata.json, and then it, opened, it opens that file using Keras. So now this model is ready to go, and it's a model. And you're probably wondering, well, how do you actually call the model? Literally, you just call it. And you're wondering how? Well, just like with a function. Let me zoom in here. So model dot, here, is this big enough? Can everyone see this? I'm gonna go red again. So model dot predict, and in there uh, you can see, I basically pass in this picture. And the picture is what's called a tensor. If you think of a tensor, it's basically a matrix 3D, and it's really easy to think about it. So if you think of a picture, it's just a picture, and in each spot, there are three numbers, R, G, B. And so think, of, uh, think of, uh, of a picture as a matrix on top of a matrix three times stacked because it's at every position there's three numbers and we pass that in. And you can see that the image size of this is image size by image size by three, which is three channels and we pass that in and it runs. So if I run this file, it will basically do the scoring, but because, my, because I foobarred my, um, my model, it's not gonna work there, but the cool thing about this is, is I can automate this using GitHub Actions too. So anytime a model is registered, and for some reason it didn't work this time, but it did fire off, notice that as soon as a model was registered, it called this. Now, for some reason it broke here, and we can look here uh, that it, it didn't, for some reason it didn't work, something's going on, right? It's transitioning. And so if I ran this process again, if I re-registered the model, this would run again. Uh, in fact, let me do that. I am going to change this here to output uh, something else. Uh, let me change this payload to another, another here, and then I will say, yay. And so now I can. I'm going to try to run this again. If it doesn't, then I'll we'll move on. Uh, git status. Git add dot. Git commit. Uh, Mit minus M added scoring output. And then we're going to do ABC123. That's not my password. But I thought I would say it because. <laughs> All right, so that's hopefully that should run the entire pipeline again. And hopefully this, this will work. So basically what this does is now we have a release pipeline that runs anytime a model is registered. Now let's go back to here and let me let me show you uh, at the end of this particular pipeline, this SEER pipeline, notice that there is this step here at the end that registers the model. Basically what it does is it finds a good model and it registers it here. Right now, the thing about machine learning is these processes can take forever. Like the, some of the better ones, um, some of the better ones, uh, like can run for a couple of days. Like a machine learning building a model, and so there's no way. Like you wouldn't want to have a GitHub action 
that sits there and waits for the model to be built and then like like for two days just sit here spinning are you done yet are you done yet are you done yet so the best way to do it is to do it in a disconnected way so now that this is done and the model has registered uh let me let me do this let me bring up let me bring up my uh my my portal here off screen so you can't see all of my glorious passwords uh, although i already did tell you about abc123 i think which is embarrassing okay and then i also don't want to show you all the other stuff you know that is a secret because i'm building secret things right now what by the way um let's go to this thing let me find my so you're probably all wondering what is he doing off screen secret stuff all of it Secret, 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 secret. So let's go to robot, which is my my machine learning workspace here. Okay. So basically, in the back end on Azure, uh, you can see that all of this stuff running here is basically this resource, right? And when I go into the back end, there's an interesting thing you can do, right? And that thing is called events. And this is now I'm taking you into the back end stuff, uh, the secret parts. Everybody get ready. Secret things are happening. In the back, you can create something called an event subscription that lives behind your Azure Machine Learning Workspace. We're going to give it an unforgettable name. Very nice. We're going to use the event grid schema. And notice these, let me, let me go down here so you can see it. These are the different events that you can map onto, right? These things right here that you can see gloriously just put there. So for example, anytime a model is registered, anytime a model is deployed, anytime a run is completed, other things which we'll talk about, we can send an event notification to anything. And for me, what I did is when I go to events, I have these things called HAL events because HAL is the name of my workspace. Yes, webhooks, indeed. And what happens is I am pushing this directly to an Azure function called router. Right, I need to go back because there's so many Azure functions in there. And I want to show you what that Azure function looks like. It's a really goofy Azure function. So ML router. Uh, I think that's what it is. And I'll, uh, let's see, LS. Uh, oh, well, it's, did I not put it in here? Let me go over here to the GitHub place. The GitHub place, I'm like 50 years old. What, is, what am I saying? Uh, so let me go over here to the actual, uh, by the way, this is a, this, we have a, we do a workshop on all this stuff. There's Cassie. Uh, there's this thing called ML router. And what it is, is it's basically an Azure function written in Python, because I love me some Python, that any time that event happens, it notifies, it notifies, it says, oh, something's happened. And it basically tells GitHub, hey, run a GitHub action. Because there are special actions in GitHub called repository dispatch uh, actions, where you can basically curl command, curl command, directly into GitHub and say, run this action. And so what's happening is, let's go back, because I want to show you. The event is fired when the model is registered, right? You can see the event's firing right there. The event is fired when the model is registered, number one. Number two, it tells this Azure function, hey, I did a thing. And basically, because it's going to tell us every single time we uh, register a model or do anything else, this, uh, this uh, Azure function says, hey, if it's a model registered event and the model is called seer, basically I, there's a, there's a, you can see right here, uh, there's some environment variables, but basically um, if seer is in the name of the model, then it belongs to this GitHub repo. And what we do is we basically post this payload to this GitHub action. Booyah. And you're probably wondering, well, how does it get all those keys? Well, in the settings, you can put keys that GitHub Actions runs, right? And so if I go back to, uh, if I go back to uh, this thing over here, 
Seer, right? You should see all of the GitHub actions that were run. So for example, this is the one, this is the one that uh, I just made a change to, right? And this one is done. And it basically, remember I did another change on the scoring file. So what's happening is this experiment is being rerun over here, right? Which is number 172. Give it a second. Notice it's still preparing and doing all this stuff. This, this should take a couple more minutes to run. And what's gonna happen is as soon as that model is registered, the event grid will tell the GitHub action hey, I have a model that's registered that then automatically runs this GitHub action. So for example, let, let me show you, it's a little different for each of these. So for, for I, I ran it this morning, by the way, just to make sure it would work seven hours ago, All right? Notice that this one has a uh, this related to it, like a branch related to it, but this one does not, right? Because I called it via a curl command, okay. So that's what's going on there. And now basically I just have to wait for this. Oh, so that one's done. And so now uh, the model registration thing is going to run. And hopefully that GitHub action does not fail because I, I don't know what's going on with my machine, but basically for some reason, the deployment failed right here. Um, oh, but basically this one's using, here, let me show you that GitHub action because I haven't showed it to you. For the deploy action, it's basically checking out the code again. But here's the cool thing, and this is the part that, that I actually think is really cool. I am pulling the reference, the reference of the GitHub action, because here's the thing that I that I totally spaced and then I did not talk about. When I run, for example, people might be changing code all the time, and so this might be running multiple times. And so what I do is I actually store the GitHub reference or the SHA of this commit. And when I send the information back, here, let me load up another GitHub here so you can see that. Uh, so there's Seer and I wanna go to ML router. So basically when I run this uh, thing again, it's basically saving the GitHub SHA command, uh, GitHub SHA, so that, uh, let's see, where, where did I put it? Where did I put it? Here. So basically when GitHub pulls the actual uh, repo, it's pulling exactly the same version of the repo code that was used to generate the model to pull the scoring file. So that way there's never a mismatch, okay? Then there, what I, I'm using the Azure CLI here in this case. And you can see that I log in with some secrets. I add the Azure CLI extension and then I run this deploy model thing. Okay. Phew. So let's go back to this action. Uh, the model registering is happening now. Hopefully this doesn't fail. And if it does, apologies, something is going on. But basically uh, this is running to deploy the model. And you're probably saying, well, where is it deploying the model to? Well to these endpoints right here. And so uh, let's wait for that to load up. This is running again. I'm using a lot of internet people. Whew. By the way, I had someone come over to my house on Saturday and run a wire from my router to this machine for all of y'all, all y'all. So FYI, I want you to know that. So let's refresh here uh, for the endpoints. There they are. There is the SEER service that it deployed to. So let's let that load up a little bit. There is this thing. Uh, looks like it's healthy. So it did deploy, but maybe GitHub Actions timed out or something. So uh, let's go back over here and see if this is still running. This is still running because it's deploying a new version. There you go. It deployed a new version. And as you're going, you're probably, well, what is he doing? So basically, remember, I ran, I reran all the code again and added on the scoring file, right? So basically, this scoring file with the model together in Azure Machine Learning lets you create an endpoint, and this endpoint lives on uh, basically uh, a Kubernetes cluster that I set up. Now I don't have to think about that too much. Let me go here because I don't want to, I don't want to load that this other stuff. So I'm going to go to the compute environment to show you what I'm talking about. Give it a second to load up. 
So let's go to this compute environment. I have this thing called an inference cluster called Sauron that loads these stuff. I don't need to do, I just said it. I'm not a Kubernetes guy. I don't know anything about Kubernetes. I just said, made me, make me a cluster. And then when I deploy, basically I just said under here, I said, hey, deploy this service with the model SEER version 38, right? Which it passed to me in the, in the event grid, target Sauron. And these are the inference. This is what you should do for inference. This is what you do for deployment, etc. For those that are wondering what that is, here is my deploy config that says use AKS, right? CPU and one gig of, of RAM. And then let me, my inference config says run the score.py file with this conda file. Now I can totally get into that. I can totally get into that uh, in another session, but because I, I'm going through the Azure machine learning part really fast, because I'm, I'm focusing on the GitHub action stuff. But now this thing is run, and so if I put this here in here, and then let's get some a good picture of some a burrito, burrito, very nice. Let's go to some images of burritos. Beautiful. And because we're conscientious we are going to filter these by only burritos that we're allowed to use and share. Uh, so let's go over here. Uh, let's open this in a new tab. Look at that delicious sofritas burrito. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say image equals what? All of this goodness up here, we just did it. And again, I, I hope you saw, I hope you saw that I actually literally added that just then. And notice that the cool thing was I didn't have to do all of the machine learning stuff. I did that before. And when I checked in my code, it ran the machine learning pipeline. And GitHub Actions was the one that initiated the machine learning pipeline. And then when Azure Machine Learning was done, it sent a message back and said, hey, GitHub, I'm done through an Azure function as a proxy, right? And it ran the deploy function all by itself. Should we do a taco? We should. Let's go back here and let's do a taco. It's getting close to dinner time and I'm hungry and this is making me hungry open image in a new tab taco tuesday let's put this bad boy slash girl i mean i'm it could be either and let's see tacos let's go back to the other one a burrito kapow it's very confident about the burrito do you notice that let's go forward Oof, super confident about the uh, taco. Now, here's the thing, and I'm going to say this because David Smith is here and he's our resident statistician. These things don't mean like percentage of confidence at all. It basically, we forced it to sum to one. So if you put, if, let's, let's, do a, let's do a test. Let's do a test here. Tell me an image of something to put in there. I'll get, like this, there's, it's going to take a little a, a, a little bit of a while, but just type into the chat. I want you to see what it does with a picture of a, and we're going to try it. Uh, I'm going to put a bicycle in there. Uh, I, did I spell bicycle wrong? I did. That's terrible. So unicorn. Uh, Clark says unicorn. Let's go back here. Uh, unicorn right here. Let's go. Wow, that is a beautiful unicorn. And by the way, if you you are free to use this commercially, this picture of this glorious unicorn, let's open this up and let's pass it over to our new AI that knows all about tacos and burritos. That is a burrito. And it's... 99% sure. And you're probably wondering why the heck is it so sure about that? Because we built a function that only knows tacos 
and burritos. And that is not a confident score. That is a softmax over a linear output, which forces the optimization algorithm to sum it to one. So can you get the validation accuracy of the current model? Why, yes, you can. And where would you look? Well, you would look in experiments here. And we would go to the latest run, SEER uh, 172, right? Then we go to the model training bit, right? We can look in the output here. And you can see that the last model that it did got a validation accuracy of 58%. No, not good. But I, didn't, I ran it on like 300 images, not very many. And I used MobileNet. So there's still work to be done as Maddie so eloquently pointed out. Uh, and it might be, uh, Maddie, that it's doing such a good job because, like, maybe some of these images I've used in the training. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, it, but basically, like, Maddie is sniffing out, like, they must be a data scientist. They're like, wow, that's doing pretty good for such a, such a, because basically I'm pulling from the training set of images. Right, just to make the presentation have more style. But if I, if you were to send me a picture of taco burrito that it had never seen, it might do terribly. But you can go to this endpoint and put that in and, and try it out. But don't break it, okay? Please. Uh, so there you go. All right. So there is the continuous delivery. Uh, by the way, we used uh, GitHub Actions with Event Grid. Our thing was we used we used GitHub Action here. Like anytime any any code change, we basically did the data prep, the training, and the model registration. That happened in the Azure Machine Learning pipeline, and then in the GitHub Actions release pipeline, we basically pulled, we basically pulled uh, the exact same repo, because for example, this might train for a week, but when you commit, there's a SHA that's associated with the commit that's given to the experiment that's passed to the model, and then the model says I'm done, and then it says GitHub pull the same code that you used to train the model because the scoring file is in there as well. And then it did a release on that using GitHub Actions. All right, but that's not the only way to do it. Another idea might be do it on a timer. For example, you can do you can do timer-based release uh, on a cron job. Like, let me show you one. And I'm going to show you the, like, uh, maybe this is a whole other thing I should show you. But basically my... Um, my whole uh, my whole blog runs on a GitHub action, and uh, and a, uh, uh, it's a static site on Azure Storage, and basically every night, every night, like at one in the morning, it just reruns it because like I might I might create I might create a post, right that I don't want to be available until a certain day. Notice that you can schedule this on a cron job to pull from master. Oh, by the way, it does it on the cron and whenever I push to master, for example, right? And I have one for for dev and for deploy because if I do like a, a if I do a structural change to my website, I want to see if it works, right? Uh, and so this is my deploy. It's it, I use Hugo, but there is an example of a cron job. So for example, you might want to run your Azure Machine Learning thing every weekend on new data, and you can do it totally do it with GitHub Action, which is really nice. So that's that example right there, but I didn't do that. I just do it on my blog or whatever you want. You might have a special branch, right? To do stuff. You might, you might in your GitHub action, run some Python code to validate against very specific data. Like say, for example, your taco burrito organization has to do the right thing with specific pictures. You can run those. And if it doesn't work, you can fail the deploy, right? Which is really nice. So um, another question from Cassie, are there any deployment gates like approvals and GitHub Actions? Not currently. Uh, so for example, if you want super sophisticated gated deploys, I would use Azure DevOps, which has other wonderful things in there like sign-offs and, and gated deploys. But in GitHub Actions, anything that you can do in a step, you can do. So for example, you might run an Azure function to test certain images on an ACI deploy and then graduate to a different GitHub action for continuous delivery. Okay. 
little summary for y'all. Uh, we talked about machine learning. We did AI ops versus ML ops. And we even did a little data ops because, you know, we, we try to round everything out. Um, we did GitHub Actions with continuous integration on code change. Notice it actually told Azure Machine Learning Service to run an Azure Machine Learning Pipeline to generate a model. Uh, Azure Machine Learning, we learned a little bit about that. We can talk a lot more about that. There's tons of other stuff in there. Like Maddie had some amazing questions about, for example, hyperparameter search. We have something like that. We also have something called automated machine learning to do a for loop, an intelligent for loop over machine learning models that it can try architectures. Uh, or, I mean, there, I could have talked a lot more about how this worked in TensorFlow, but I didn't, right? Uh, which was, it's kind of a bummer. TensorFlow is awesome. I have an example of this in PyTorch as well, uh, if you're interested. Uh, let, me, um, let me bring that up. So you can see it, it's a food AI, uh, but this isn't. This one isn't in a pipeline at all. It's basically all just one thing. It does it all in one thing, right? Notice that it's all, it's all PyTorchiness uh, in here uh, because love me some PyTorch. You know, I I vacillate between PyTorch and TensorFlow. If I may may wax poetic, like I couldn't stand TensorFlow one point fourteen. And I was like, that's it, I'm going to PyTorch. And then I was like, TensorFlow 2 came out and I was like, oh, this is nice. But then I went, I've gone back to PyTorch since then. I think PyTorch is, is really good because look how beautiful that is. I mean, but then again, it looks just like, just looks like Keras, right? Um, but this is cool. Like I, I have a back off uh, on, uh, on learning rate here, which is kind of cool, uh, et cetera. Uh, ensemble. To death, yes. Maddie, man. They know their stuff. Maybe we're, if we're hiring one day, we should invite you. All right, now that's all I've got. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or let me take away my face. I'm at Seth Juarez on Twitch as well as on Twitter. You can reach out to me at Seth.Juarez at Microsoft.com if you have any questions. But hopefully this has been helpful to you. Uh, I had a good time. Maybe I should do more. Honestly, I've been thinking I've been doing Twitch streams on the math behind this stuff because I like the math. Some people don't. And so if you're interested in that, um, shoot me a request for that. And maybe I should do my own Twitch streams on math. By the way, there is something called MML Book, uh, which is fantastic. I, I, was, I was talking to David about it. And boy, that was, it was some glorious stuff. Uh, it teaches the math in just such a beautiful way. And so love that stuff. And, you know, I wanted to do it not just because I know the math, because maybe I need to brown myself out a little bit better. I know some of the math, right? I'm very good at uh, vision, uh, computer vision stuff. Um, and so I know the math behind that and some calculus, etc. But again, I'm happy to, to do more of these things. It's a great joy to be with you. Uh, hopefully this was useful to you. And if it wasn't, it was free. So don't complain. Thank you so much for being with us. Hopefully you'll watch next time. Again, it's been a joy with you. See you next time, my friends. I am going to be signing off. Take care.